Hello there and welcome back to another video here on Wristwatch Revival. My name is Marshall. Thank you so much for coming along. This time on the bench, we've got this beautiful dress watch from Universal Genève. It's an automatic, it's actually a bumper movement. It's in pretty rough shape as you can see in desperate need of uh, some tender love and care, but it's a nice little dress watch, gorgeous in gold. And uh, from a, a company that I really love, Universal Genève, they've, uh, they're defunct now. They're, they're no longer in business uh, in a at least properly. Um, but the watches from them are great. They're really, they had a really nice run with some really great stuff back in the day. Uh, you can look them up and see some chronographs that they had and uh, some dress watches like this. The pull routers, a, a huge popular model from them as well that has a micro rotor uh, automatic movement, which is really cool. And uh, yeah, I am really happy to get my hands on this one off of eBay. It, um, it's running, but not really. As you can see, the, the seconds hand will kind of go and then stop, and, and it just really is in poor shape overall. Uh, it is a gold-plated watch with really beautiful lugs and a classic kind of simple design on it. And first things first, we need to figure out how to get into the case. So the plan for this watch uh, is to do what we always do, which is to completely disassemble the watch. Uh, determine any faults with it, completely clean it, and then reassemble it and see if we can't get it running well and looking well at the same time. There's something very therapeutic about it, isn't there? Uh, <laughs> how many things that you own do you completely disassemble down to every single screw, <laughs> you know, and then clean it all perfectly clean and then put it all back together, right? That's just not really how we do things anymore. And uh, it's one of the many reasons that I love watchmaking. And, uh, and I hope you agree with me on that. You can see the bumper movement here. So this is a, a way to automatically wind the watch that doesn't use the free spinning rotor that you'll see on most automatic movements. Now, it has a rather heavy weight that bangs up against those springs you can see at the bottom and kind of goes back and forth. And when it does so, it winds up the watch. See, there's a screw missing here, but this is just on the, uh, the movement support. So I'm not sure how important that is. We'll have to get into it. As you can see, the watch is also running at least a little bit. I wouldn't say it's running great, but it is running. Kind of barely going. So now how do we get this thing out of here is the question. And maybe this, uh, this little stand that the springs for the bumper sit on is keeping it in the case. I'm not 100% sure. This is the second time that I've worked on a bumper before. The other one's actually on the channel as well. I did notice that the there's an outer bezel on this so that it's possible that the movement actually comes through the front. On some of these older ones, especially with the detachable bezel there, the movement will come out the front of the watch rather than the back but it seems to be giving me a little bit of pain here. So let's just get the hands off of this watch now. That way we don't have to worry about them as I try to take the movement out of the case. It's always interesting, you know, when I do watches for the channel, sometimes I'll do the same type of watch multiple times. I like doing that, but a lot of times I, I am dealing with a watch or a movement or a case that I've never touched before. And there we go, by the way, check that out. It does actually fall right out the front. So there we go. And we can set aside the case, which definitely needs some cleaning. Let's get an initial time graph for reading though, now that we have the movement out and see how it actually looks. Oh no. Oof, yeah, this is rough. Uh, it's losing somewhere around two minutes a day. And also, uh, you can see the amplitude is reading at zero. Now, it's obviously not zero. Otherwise, that would mean that the watch isn't running at all. But it's not high enough. And it had that snowflake kind of lost in a snow globe kind of look to the reading. So it, this this thing is running horrendously bad. In fact, the... Uh, the amplitude was so low that it wouldn't even pick up a reading. So at least a cleaning and service is going to be needed on this watch. Hopefully that's it. Um, but, you know, sometimes as you go through, you, you, you find that it needs more than that. So we'll start by removing the uh, 
the automatic winding works here. These usually sit on top of the regular movement, and that looks to be the case here as well. Yeah, there we go. So there's the, the big rotor and then the top plate that kind of holds it all in place. And I'll put everything into the dust tray here. And now I'll go ahead and take off the balance. As you know, I like to do this uh, before really getting into the guts of the watch, primarily because I'd like to be able to protect it. It's that simple. And I'm also, you can see I'm taking apart the watch on this gel cushion thing, which I don't normally do, but remember the dial is still attached. Um, and so I just don't wanna get it scratched up or bent or anything. As you can see, there is still power coming down the main spring, which is a good sign. That means that, you know, we've got a, we've got at least power going through the, the spring and then the, the train of wheels. Okay, now we can take out the automatic winding works gears. So these are what transfer that back and forth motion of the bumper into actual winding on the watch itself. And this is a click. And that goes right there. And then there's a click spring, which is actually really nice. It's this long, thin spring that kind of reaches around the wheel. I like that. Okay, now we can start to work on getting the, the barrel bridge off here as well. But as I start to loosen it, <clears throat> I realize I need to take off some more stuff off the top here before I'm actually gonna be able to take it off. It's a little bit of a different setup on a bumper movement, but it's similar enough that I can see. Now I'm gonna take this small bridge off here, and this one's actually interesting. It has a jewel on it, and normally that jewel would engage with the center seconds pinion below it, but this one actually doesn't. That jewel is actually the bottom jewel <laughs> for the automatic winding part. So that's kind of interesting. Um, it is jeweled, and that's nice because that automatic winding often will, uh, will get damaged and need to be replaced the the pinion on the rotor. So that's pretty cool. Now though, I can actually get in and start to take out the center seconds pinion, which is right there in the very, very center of the watch. And that's what the seconds hand actually attaches to and spins around. Okay, now I can take the barrel. Uh, the The ratchet wheel, I should say, <clears throat> off the watch here, like so. And that'll allow me to actually remove the barrel bridge, which is what I've been trying to do for a little while. <laughs> and there it comes. And all told, I mean, this movement's old. You can tell that, you know, it's been serviced a bunch of times and it's got its wear and tear, but it's certainly in decent shape overall. And there's definitely hope for this thing. Okay, now we can take the train wheel bridge off. Gently. Now I can't take the center wheel off because it's attached to the cannon pinion on the other side of the watch and I can't get to the cannon pinion yet because I haven't figured out how to take the dial off yet. <laughs> Cause this one is just a bit of a weird setup with how it is. And I'm like trying to figure out how to get to the dial screws here. And as I turn the watch over, uh, three of the train wheels fall out, which is fine. You never want to force them out, but if they fall out on their own, that's that's fine, but I do need to make sure that I 
set those aside. I still haven't actually got the dial off of this watch yet. But maybe here I've finally found where the dial feet screws are. Yes, yes, I have. <laughs> I needed to get a bunch of other parts out of the way as it turns out. Now, had I known exactly how this worked from the get-go, I, I could have taken the dial off straight away, but it took me a while to find, because they are actually hidden. You actually have to remove another part to be able to see them, the dial feet screws. And there we go, the dial comes off, hooray. And it looks like it took the Canyon Pinion and the hour wheel with it, but that's fine. I can separate those out and get them clean and take a look at the dial. You know what? I really like this dial. Yeah, it's got some patina on it, right? This is a vintage watch, but it looks nice. I think I'm going to just give it a little bit of love, uh, maybe clean it up just a little bit. And I think it'll be good to go. Okay, now we can actually look at the parts underneath on the dial side. And by the way, that's the center wheel finally coming out. And, and then there's this ring around the outside that looks to be, it's missing a part here. So I don't think that'll affect anything. Three quarters of that ring should provide the same support that a full would, or half would not. So I think we're fine on that. And that's why whoever had this in here before just put it back in. But I'll have to kind of test that out when we put it back in. Just make sure that it's stable. It's 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 to support the the movement when it's inside the case. But yeah, now we can actually look at the dial side of the watch, which is primarily the keyless works, which is what allows you to wind the watch and set the hands, and the motion works, which is actually what turns the hands as they go around. And almost done with this side. Got to be careful with the yoke spring here so it doesn't go flying off. I've had that happen. Nothing like spending an hour underneath your desk with a flashlight. And there the yoke comes out as well. And this is kind of one of those spring-loaded setting lever situations. So that's the spring for it there. And that means I can take the setting lever out the other side now. And there it comes. And there we go, we've got everything completely taken apart. And that means that I can get everything ready for the watch cleaning machine now. And of course, this is uh, the part where I put everything through the full cleaning treatment to give it the best possible clean that I can. Mainly you're looking to get rid of old dried on oil and any debris or dirt that's floating around. And as you can see, everything goes into this basket. I also put the really small parts in the really small basket so that I don't lose anything. And before we put it in, let's take a quick look at the case here. You can see the crystal comes right out. It is gonna need to be replaced. That, that crystal is gone. A lot of dirt on it, a lot of scratching. And taking a quick look at the case, it looks like it hasn't been cleaned ever. I mean, th this has just caked on gunk. It is really nasty. And so what I'm going to do is put it in my ultrasonic cleaner. But before I do, I'm gonna take a piece of peg wood here and just start to work my way around the edges where there's the really hardcore caked on stuff just to try to loosen it up a bit so that the ultrasonic can do its thing because this is bad. I mean, ugh. that is a lot of gunk under there. So we need to take care of that. Um, but it also gives me some hope for the watch because if it looked pretty decent when it was this dirty and there was this much junk under the uh, bezel and all that, imagine what it could look like after I give it a, a real cleaning in the ultrasonic. Here's the inside of the bezel where the crystal goes and I'm making sure to try to get any dirt out of there as well. And here's where the case back goes. Now there's also a little bit of rust here or some type of corrosion on it. So there we go, a quick pass over with the, uh, with the peg wood and it means that we are ready to put the watch into the watch cleaning machine. And this is a fairly simple four stage process. The first one is a cleaning solution and then the second two are rinses and then the third is a heated dry so that there's no liquid or anything that uh, can sit on the watch for any period of time. And while I do this, I did want to mention I have a Patreon for this YouTube channel. Uh, if you like the videos I'm doing and uh, you wanna support me, 
The Patreon's the place to go for that. Uh, it's really simple. It's completely transparent. You can change uh, your amount anytime you want. You can pick what amount you want. You get a thank you card and a sticker in the mail uh, for everybody who signs up, no matter the level. And you get access to some cool extra stuff. Like for example, I post the rough cuts of these videos for my patrons before they go up. So you can kind of see what's coming down the line and I'll do some project updates and stuff like that. Um, I wanted to also thank everybody over on the Patreon for supporting me, particularly Trevor, Ross, Robert, NT, Mitchell, Michael, Mikey, Mara, Kevin, James, George, Erica, Dustin, Dominic, Brinton, Brian, Brian, Brett, Brad, and Alex. Thank you very much for your support. It really does mean the world to me. Okay, now that it's done cleaning, I can take it off, but it, the basket does get hot after it's been in the heated dry, so beware. <laughs> and now we can put the case parts into the ultrasonic cleaner as well. Ultrasonic cleaners are really one of the best tools to have around if you're gonna be doing watch restoration because they're non-abrasive, like they don't take any material off, but they're very, very good at getting things really, really clean using just like a detergent and some heat. That's about it. Plus, of course, the, the ultrasonic action from the, the cleaner itself. And we can take the case parts out and then they need to be rinsed off under water just to make sure that all the detergent comes off. And there we go, here's the parts out of the cleaning machines as they were. Glimmering in the afternoon sun in this particular case. And that means that we can get underway with getting this thing back together. Now, I did put the balance back on the bridge, or excuse me, the main plate, so that it could take its little journey through the uh, watch cleaning machine, but as we work towards reassembling the, by the way, very nice looking movement now, that thing cleaned up great. We can now uh, take the balance off. Just like that. And that means that we can get rolling and we'll kick things off with the train of wheels here. This is the escape wheel going in first. Just has to make sure, just have to make sure that it engages with the pivot below. And now the center wheel goes in. And now we can go for the, the uh, train wheel bridge here. And again, this has three jeweled uh, pivot holes on the top there. And the pivots need to go into those jewel holes each, each time. And you'll know that they are when the train wheels spin freely rather than aren't engaged. <laughs> Like that, that's what you want to see. Just a gentle touch of the wheel and it'll spin and that means that you're okay to screw down this uh, bridge. And just another quick double check before we continue, looks good. Now we need to put the barrel in, but I haven't actually put the barrel back together yet. So I'm gonna reuse the spring on this. Now, this is an old school spring. They don't make springs like this now. It's like a carbon steel spring. The newer ones are generally considered better, um, but I do like to try to keep original parts when possible. And this spring's actually in pretty decent shape for what it is. So I'm just gonna go ahead and reuse it for this particular one. If not, I could measure it and order a replacement spring and uh, and get that in and <clears throat> and use it. But here, I'm, I'm gonna actually be happy just to reuse this one, I think. Okay, so it goes back in the barrel and then I can put the barrel arbor in. And just a little bit of 
HP 1300 because that actually is on a part that engages with this lid here and I want to make sure that it uh, is lubricated. And I can just click that down. Okay, so now we've got the mainspring barrel complete and that means that we can put it into the movement. And as you can see, it engages with the center wheel there. And before we put down the barrel bridge, we need to make sure that we get this spring here for the setting lever. This is not the traditional setting lever spring. This is the one that provides the tension because there's two types of ways to get the, the crown and stem, winding stem out of your watch, right? There's one where you undo a little screw and then pull it out. And there's one where you push down on a little button. And this is one of the push down on the little button ones. And that spring is what provides that tension, but that needs to be in place before we put this barrel bridge down. But now that it is, we can do so. I really hope this watch runs well. Uh, it is a an absolutely beautiful watch. Again, I, I bought this off of eBay, which is where I get most of my project watches. I mean, Sometimes they come to me th through other people, but for the most part, I'm kind of hunting around on eBay for, for watches that look like they might be a good candidate for the channel. Now I can use some HP 1300 to lubricate where the barrel meets up with the bridge. And I'm gonna put a little bit of HP 1300 as well here on the center wheel. And just make sure that that's looking right. And now we can continue with the build by putting the ratchet wheel on. go. And these are now the different parts of the automatic winding. Once again, this is the center wheel or the center seconds pinion. And that means that I need to press on the extended pivot here. So that goes on there and then that engages with the center seconds pivot pinion. And I'm just going to use a hand press to push this into place like so. And this is a tension spring for that center seconds. It's a little bit of a finicky one because the screw is very, very, very small. So I'm gonna actually hold down the spring <laughs> while also putting the screw into place with my other hand and then with the other hand still grabbing the screwdriver and engaging the screw. It is, it takes a little practice, let's put it that way. And once again, this is that top bearing for the automatic winding rotor, which is kind of funny because it looks like it would just be a normal jewel for a, you know, for a, a pivot jewel like on the watch, but it's actually not. It's for the, for the rotor. Okay. Now, once again, we need to put this uh, kind of long click spring that's used to engage the automatic winding portion. This is also very, very finicky. So I'm trying to hold the screw with the screwdriver, but then also engage it. And there we go. So I've got that put on. And now this is the bridge that goes over the automatic winding works. You can see there's the top half of that jewel for the middle rotor right in the center of the movement. And that kind of makes a sandwich there for the rotor. Now I haven't actually put the rotor in yet. You can see it sitting off to the side, but I want to make sure that everything's engaging properly. And it's not for some reason, this thing just wants to keep kicking back and I'm looking and there's this little click and it doesn't actually seem to be engaged. Meaning that there's no pressure on it, even though I put that spring on. So I might need to address that. In the meantime, let's go ahead and put the rotor in and make sure that it's going to engage properly with that brass part, which is what it's supposed to do. And it looks like it is, so that part's good. And I can buckle it back down. 
But as you can see, this click just still isn't engaging properly with that brass part. So I'm gonna back it off a little bit here and try to see if I can't just bump it up. There, see that, that click should be engaged now. And then if I gently tighten this back down while it's still engaged, it should act as a click, meaning that it, it can go one direction but not the other. And it is. All right, so we figured that out. <laughs> it's the little things, you know. So now we can flip the watch over to the other side and take a look at the uh, motion works and the keyless works and get that going. So we'll start with the end of the motion works here. This is an intermediate wheel. That's a cannon pinion and it just clicks into place. And there's the minute wheel. And you can kind of see how that little train of gears goes. One to the next to the next. A little bit of grease here uh, <clears throat> needed for multiple parts. Uh, one of them is gonna be the yoke spring and this is gonna be the sliding clutch and the clutch wheel. So I'll put the sliding clutch into place, grab the clutch wheel, little bit of grease on the face where it actually interfaces as well. That's very important. Uh, that's a very, very high friction part of the watch. Okay, so that goes into place and now I can line up the yoke spring. I've already greased up the, uh, the kind of holder for that. So we're good to go there. And now I want to lubricate the winding stem here so that I can put it into the watch. Carefully, carefully. <laughs> there we go. Make sure everything's lined up properly. And we'll grab the yoke spring here as well. It provides tension on the yoke itself. And the setting lever spring goes on top of that. And now we can give it a quick test here and just make sure that it's engaging properly with the mainspring barrel to wind it and with the motion works when it's in the setting position. Again, we're gonna grease up this spring here as well because as you can see, that's a fairly high tension part. It's held under tension from the spring and this will aid in use because when you pull it out, push it in, you want that to be smooth, right? And, uh, and that blue grease that we put on there is what helps that. Now I can lubricate the bottom half of the barrel. And now we can go ahead and put back in the, uh, the pallet fork. And you know what that means? We're getting really close to seeing if this thing's gonna run. And if it does run, how well will it run? So with the pallet fork bridge, we just wanna make sure that the pivots from the pallet fork are engaged with the jewel before we tighten anything down. And that's what we'll do. And now we can grab the balance and let's see if this thing will go for us. I'm really hoping it just kicks up Never having worked on the movement, you know, you have to kind of start over again. So I'm just like, come on, baby. Oh, it looks like it wants to go. And it does want to go. This is fantastic. As you can see, it really wanted to go. It picked right up. And now it's cooking. Looks like we've got some good amplitude there too. <clears throat> This is about the best case scenario <laughs> when you're working on watches like this is that it kicks right up like that and has a good strong pulse.
And beautiful. That is what you want to see. We can give it a good wind as well and let it, uh, let it really kind of get moving. And look at that. Beautiful sight. Mwah! Love seeing that. <laughs> I could just watch that forever, but we won't because this job is not done yet. So let's get to the lubrication part. So this is on the microscope now and we'll get cooking on lubricating these things up, these jewels up. These are actually for the automatic winding and this jewel, you know, is one of the train jewels and you can see I'm using uh, Mobius 9010 here to lubricate those. Now we of course need to do the cap jewels. Now, I'm actually going to show you <clears throat> up close and personal how I do this for the whole process. So the first thing is to open up the hinge here for the spring. Then I'm going to use some Rodico to take out the two parts that make up the jewel assembly on the top. So that first one I did was actually called the cap jewel. And then the bottom is the setting. And I'm going to put those on a piece of paper here. And here they are, you can see them laid out. Now I'm gonna put them into a solvent. In this case, I'm gonna use one dip. And this is uh, to dissolve, <clears throat> or at least to attempt to dissolve, any dried on oil, debris, or anything that's on there. The goal is to get these perfectly clean. Now, while they're sitting in the one dip, hey, we might as well jump over <clears throat> and lubricate another bearing that we hadn't got to yet. <laughs> Cause you know, let's be efficient with our time, right? So now I can take the two parts out of the one dip. Now these are very, very small as you can see. This is uh, this kind of thing takes practice, but I have been practicing and I've gotten pretty decent at it now. That's the setting. And then this is the cap jewel. Now the cap has two sides and they are actually different. One of them is flat and one of them is domed. And the part that you want is the flat side and you're actually gonna put oil directly onto that. So I'm gonna flip this thing over a few times and I'm also gonna flip over the setting and you'll see why I have that face down. The reason I put this on paper, by the way, is because it helps to uh, pull the solution away. Now take a look, what I'm doing is I'm trying to put oil right in the middle, about 30% of the total surface area of this little tiny thing. And you can see the oil sitting on there right in the middle. Then what I'm gonna do is take the now facing down setting and boop, put it right on top. And what it does is there's a capillary action that holds the two together. And that's it. Now this is ready to go back into the watch. And we have to carefully just place it back in its setting. Just like that. And then I can put the spring part back on top here for the Inca block setting. And I like to pull my tweezers across that rather than have to push it in because it's quite a finicky little spring. So I'll just turn the whole entire movement around and done. Button that up and now there's a drop of oil that is suspended directly above where the pivot is and that oil will stay there. That's why you can't put in too much. If you put in too much, it'll reach the edges and it'll actually run off the sides. So let's Flip the watch, now this is the top, and as you can see, it's the same type of setting here for the balance, and let's do it all over again. Here's my Rodico, and this time the setting actually comes out in one chunk. There it is. And I can put that whole thing into the one dip, and the one dip as a solvent will actually just separate those two out anyway. And then again, we can let the one dip kind of work its magic here. And as you can see, the watch just sort of keeps happily running away, waiting for us to come back to it. Okay, so there's the cap jewel. And now we'll grab the setting. And there it is. Now let's take a look at this cap jewel again. This is the bottom, but do you see that dirt and oil that's still on there? We need to get that off. These should be clean, clean, clean. So I'm gonna take a small piece of peg wood here and grab the jewel and I'm just gonna give it a little cleaning. And I'm really just, that's all I'm doing is just rubbing on it with the peg wood. Then I can put it back into the one dip to clean off anything that's left. And there we go, that's what you wanna see. You want it to be a clean surface with no caked on oil or dirt or anything like that. 
And now I can grab some more Mobius 9010 oil. This is the lightest oil that we have. And see, this is the flat side of the jewel, not the dome side, that part goes up. And I can take my little oiler here and start to apply, again, a, you know, about 30-ish percent of that surface should be oil. That gives it enough to last for multiple years, but doesn't put you at risk of having it go over to the edge and bleed off. And there we go. Once again, the jewel setting all ready to go and we can put this back into the watch. So let's grab it, move back over to the microscope so that you can see, <laughs> and there we go. It goes right in and you can see the oil suspended right around the middle, which is exactly what you want. And once again, carefully, I will put this uh, shock setting back into place. Just like that. And now we have successfully done all of the lubrication and let's take a look at how it does on the time grafter after a quick regulation and it is stunning. Look at that. This is like a 60, maybe 70 year old watch and it's running at minus three seconds a day, 313 degrees of amplitude and no beat error. <laughs> I mean, this thing is fantastic. Like. What an amazing movement. I I have to tip my hat to Universal Geneve for having put together a movement that could run at this rate all those years later. I mean, that is absolutely incredible. So really fantastic. Now let's uh, turn our attention to the dial because I mentioned it before, I love this dial. It has this kind of golden peach kind of color to it. I do not want to do anything crazy. Um, but I would like to just do a light cleaning on it. I'm not the type that wants to take off the patina and make it look new. I like the patina on it. I like how it looks a little bit worn. I think it gives it a lot of character. So I'm not gonna be trying to resurface this or redo anything, but I don't want there to be dirt sitting on the surface of the dial. I don't think that that adds to anything. So I'm gonna very lightly with just water and this very soft applicator, I'm just gonna try to give it a once over to take off any dust or dirt that's on it. And then I've got this little leather kind of polishing tool thing, cleaning tool, and I can use this on the applied uh, hour indexes and I'm just gonna rub it on there on the top very gently just to take off any corrosion or um, any remaining dirt that might be on each of the numbers. It doesn't really do that much. It's just a nice little touch to make sure that there's nothing kind of hanging out on there that's gonna get worse. And there we go. That's all I'm gonna do for the dial. Very simple, just make sure that it's nice and cleaned up, there's no dirt in it, and, uh, and, and call it good there. Now I'll put the dial back in its little holder here. I like to just use these because it just protects the dial from getting accidentally ding dropped or hit or whatever. Okay, so now we need to take a look at getting this crystal replaced because that crystal was way too far gone to be considered. So I'm gonna use my Rober press here and this is a very simple device. As you can see, all it's really gonna do is push down on the crystal from the outside to bend its outer diameter in say half a millimeter, so that I can put the bezel around the outside of it and then release that pressure so that it expands into the bezel. It's that simple. That's really all it takes to replace a crystal like this, but a tool like this is really handy for it. And there we go. So the crystal looks great and so does the bezel. It looks like it's cleaned up quite nicely. Let's take a look at the rest of the case as well now that it's out of the cleaning machine too and it cleaned up really nicely. Wow, that is way better uh, than I could have hoped for realistically. So that's fantastic. And it means that we're good to go on the final build. So let's go down the stretch here and uh, get this watch completed. I'm getting excited about this one. I may have gotten a real nice find on eBay with this. Uh, the movement is fantastic and is running like an absolute champ and the case cleaned up nicely, the dial held up beautifully. I'm kind of thinking to myself, I got a winner here. So we'll put the dial back on first. We can grab the hands now. 
They use a special box to hold the hands. It has like kind of a, a membrane on the inside that kind of suspends them there. Again, just to be careful with them, you know, I, I don't know. The box was like a couple bucks. I figure why not? I've decided not to do anything to the hands. I could resurface them or polish them up or give them a little more attention, but they have a certain kind of wear to them that I really like, and I'm not going to touch them. I, I want to keep that intact. Okay, put the minute hand on, give it a quick test. Looks good. That means we can put the seconds hand on now. And there we go. So the hands look good. And now, how does this support thing go in? It looks like it just wants to sit in here and then it gets screwed in from the other side. And again, I think that'll be fine because it is three quarters of the support and that should be enough to support the movement and stuff with no issue whatsoever. So I'll just screw that in and then we'll put the, the movement in the dial and everything in. Make sure that there's no dust on it. And now I can put the front bezel on. Ooh, that looks good. I love the lugs on this watch too. I think that's one of the subtle, really cool design elements is it has like a slightly twisted kind of lug profile on it. Okay, now we can put the back on. And look at that, it is gorgeous. This thing came out beautifully. Wow. And I love that patina on the dial, by the way. You can see a little bit of that coloration on the bottom. And I just love that. I think it looks really, really cool like that. And same with the hands. I think it gives this watch a lot of character. Super simple design, but a beautiful dress watch here from Universal Genève. Now, taking a look at it, though, there's one thing that just kept bothering me, and it's the crown. So that's brass showing through. This is a gold-plated watch, and the crown received enough wear that the brass is just straight up showing through, and it doesn't match or look right. So I'm going to – I just can't live with myself and keep this on here, and I'm going to replace the crown. So I'm going to show you how I do that. Yay, we get more. <laughs> so do you see how that's just the brass showing through and you can see on the edges how it's still gold plated? That's not what you want, right? I, I want that to look proper. So what I'm gonna do is start by taking off the old crown. So I'm gonna use a pin vise here to lock down the, uh, the stem. And then I can just simply unscrew the crown by hand. It should just come off. Just like this. So there we go, the old crown comes off. And now we need to select a replacement crown. And as once again, you can see on the edges and on the bottom, the design of this crown. And I wanna get something that looks as similar to that as possible. So I've got a few different little crown assortment assortments that I've bought over the years. And we're gonna see if I can find one that seems to fit for this watch. So this is the same design type. And this looks like a pretty close fit, actually. Yeah, these are actually very similar. And this looks like it's about the right size as well. Now there is one size up that I could maybe choose. <clears throat> and as you can see, this one's slightly bigger, but also right in that same range. They're, they're eh, right about the same. So I might just try them both out and see which one fits or if, if which one seems to work best for the watch. So I'm just gonna do a quick test fit without the crown just to see how it looks and sits on the case. That's not bad, that looked about right. Let's try this one. Oh, 
All right, I think I'm going to go with the bigger one. I think it just looks like it fit just right. So here we go. I can see another quick test fit. Now, this isn't me putting it on in a final way because look at what happens. When you use a new crown, oftentimes the stem part of the crown is a different size. So this is with it completely put into the watch where I can set the watch and wind the watch. But look, it's sticking out too far. Now what that means is, is that we need to trim the actual stem itself down. So I'm gonna take a quick measurement here of the difference that we need to cut off of it. And it's about one millimeter. So just under a millimeter, 0.98 millimeters. And then I need to take out the stem and then once again, take off the crown from it. And then we need to trim off that much. Now, this is a tricky process because if you trim off too much of this, it will not work anymore. The It won't line up properly inside with the keyless works. So this is very much a measure three times cut once type scenario. And in fact, it's even more so than that. So as you've seen, I can mark it. You can see the marking there. And I'm gonna clip this just like that and just get the very, very tip of it. And then I'm gonna use this file here to, well, to do two things. One is I'm using it to take off the burrs, right? Because those will actually tear up the inside of the crown threads because they're they're brass. So you got You have to do that anyway. But I'm also going to use the file to ge to gently remove material if needed. So let's do a test fit once again. And as you can see, I didn't take off quite enough here. It looks like there's still a pretty significant gap there. So I'm going to use the file to gently remove more and more because I can really control how much I remove with the file where when you do it with the clippers there, it can be easy to accidentally take off too much. I've already took off a decent chunk with it. And so now I'm gonna go ahead and just use the file to keep on removing material and, uh, and bringing it down to the exact size that we need again. If you go too far, you can't go back. You have to go try to find a new winding stem and that can be a real pain. So there we go. After actually what ended up being a few attempts, I finally have it at exactly the right size, the size that I was looking for. Now the last thing to do is to use a little bit of Loctite and this will make sure that the crown stays in place. This is a uh, on the lower end of the bonding for the Loctite. Loctite, for those of you that haven't seen it, is a way that you can make sure that something that gets screwed in stays that way. Um, but there's different levels of Loctite. Some of them make it so that it's kind of permanent. <laughs> and some of them are, are like this one, just mean that it won't uh, come unscrewed on its own, but you can still unscrew that later on. And once again, back into the watch it goes after having dried off, it takes about a day for it to completely dry out, but it's pretty usable after just about 20 minutes or so. And there we go. Now I can put the case back on the watch with its brand new crown. And I'm even gonna throw a watch strap on this thing. These gold watches are always kind of tricky when it comes to figuring out what, uh, what kind of strap to put on it. So I'll probably try out a few different ones that you'll see here. And there we go, the finished product as it were, an absolutely charming Universal Genève automatic dress watch with uh, really cool lugs and an absolutely stunning movement that is performing really, really well. Uh, you know, beyond all reasonable expectation, I would say. And there it is out in the wild as well. Awesome watch and a really fun restoration. I'm super glad you were able to join me for it. And I wanna thank you for hanging out. If you'd like to uh, follow me on social media, I do have an Instagram for the channel. It's wristwatch underscore revival. And I post like, you know, in between project updates and uh, some watches from my own personal collection and stuff like that over there. So feel free to, to uh, follow me over there if you'd like. And um, yeah, I, I really want to extend my thanks for hanging out with me. I, re I really appreciate that you take the time to uh, go on this journey with me whenever I post up one of these videos. We'll see you on the next one.